Welcome to What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the NASDAQ 100 total return index in USD, and there's also a little bit of NASDAQ 100 notional net total return data in AUD, we'll see. Some people would know the ETFs that seek to track the return of these indices as Invesco's QQQ in the US and Beta Shares NDQ in Australia. Your investment philosophy book we wrote, shameless plug, available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say our intent is educational, not rendering financial advice. Don't make us tap to sign. These are simple concepts we'd like investors to better understand performance in the short and long term so they can make informed decisions. So periodic performance, uh, just first up, the NASDAQ 100 is 100 of the largest domestic and international non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ stock market based on market cap and the index reflects companies across industry groups, groups including computer hardware and software, telecommunications, retail, wholesale trade, and biotechs. Uh, most people know it as a tech-focused index, though. A couple of points, the NASDAQ 100 came into inception in 1985 price only, so we're using the total return data available from 1999 in the US, which still covers a very important time period as the inception return highlights. It's much lower than some of the more short run returns. And down the bottom, even shorter run net notional total return in AUD, which looks even better. And you can see why some Australian investors uh, might be looking licking their lips when looking at this index. Yeah, look, the uh, the fact that the uh, total return index that's available there is, you know, only a bit over 15 years, it also doesn't include the tech rec that, that's actually included in the earlier numbers, you know, from from April 1999 through to 2001, you know, the tech sector in, in the US uh, was really a net loser of capital. So... You know that extra few years that's in that uh, price data on the or that data that's rather on the top line has that first few years of awful results in it, and hence the returns look more subdued. Buying into the Nasdaq by the August of two thousand and seven, it it wasn't the low point in the market by any means, but certainly it was a low starting point, and returns have been very strong subsequently. So growth of wealth, uh, a big shoot up there early in the piece and a decline and long plateau. And since regaining its previous high, it's continued to rocket upwards. Yeah, look, the uh, the tech sector was looked at with very rose-coloured glasses, you know, from 1999 through, you know, to the middle of 2000. And then it copped an absolute bath, as this chart you know, shows. $2 invested around the end of the year 2000 by the end of March 2002 was worth about 40 cents. Whereas you then look at the way that sort of bumped along the bottom for about nine to 10 years, and then the tech sector gets its act together and investors start buying tech stocks and prices really start to rise, as evidenced by the rapid increases on the way through to the pre-COVID period, and then even the recovery after COVID. And range of returns, big range in the one-year periods, and you start to get an inkling of how bad that decline was. But this is a classic risk return story. The range of best to worst for the one year is a lot wider than the broader market. But you don't have a broader market here. You have a very narrow market focusing on just 100 technology-related stocks. So when it's good, it's going to be extraordinary. But when it's bad, it's going to be awful. And that's exactly what this chart shows on the left-hand side. And even when you look at the three-year numbers and and the five-year numbers, right through to the 10-year numbers, it's still strongly negative. But the average return through the whole period is pretty dash healthy. And that's a very much just the classic risk reward story. Rolling annual returns and some deep declines there. And I think same with the point you made there, this is a hundred stock index, so it's not massively diversified. And you'll have to take the good with the bad whenever they come. You can see at the left-hand end of the chart, some pretty awful outcomes. 
then the GFC comes along just left of centre, then COVID comes along to the right. When it's bad, it's going to be really bad. And there's going to be periods of euphoria as evidenced by the five or six really strong spikes over the course of that chart. Historic chance of a positive or negative, and probably interesting to note here, the chance of a negative historically is a little bit higher than what you'd see in other indices it's just another piece of evidence that refers to the risk reward characteristics of this particular index. You know, if we were looking at an MSCI world index, then by about the 10 year mark, there'd be no negative returns. But this is a much narrower, much more concentrated index portfolio of stocks of a particular type, as I indicated before. When it's good, it's going to be great. And when it's bad, it's got to be awful. Largest fall in time and recovery, and this is the tech brick or the dot-com bubble in a chart, really, or the end of the dot-com bubble in a chart, and it's kind of akin to the Great Depression on the S&P 500, if you look at it. It's similar to similar decline, similar time to recover, and this isn't back in the 1930s. This was just over 20 years ago, and there's a lot of people today who just, just go all in on, on a NASDAQ ETF and... If you're doing that back then, you'd be wiped out, not only financially, but probably mentally too, because you can't necessarily write out things like this because it has an effect on people. Most likely, you're going to jump out and miss the recovery. And I think NASDAQ, with return gaps, has one of the one of the largest return gaps out of any index out there. And this is the reason why. This is a period of, I think, uh, 13 and a half years, sorry, 14 and a half years is is the downturn from peak to peak. But there's a very interesting piece of evidence in there. The person that was courageous enough to invest a second dollar at the bottom, that dollar grew to be worth $5 by the end of the period. So they've got their first dollar back. They've added a second dollar. And at the right-hand end, they've actually got $6. The investor that just stuck with their original decision and, and didn't follow the classic investment theory that if you're invested in a quality asset that goes down in value, the best thing you can do is buy more of it. And the investor that had the courage to do that has turned $2 into 6 They've actually done pretty damn well. Mm, yeah, it's probably been life-changing from the bottom, but <laughs> equally life-changing from the top down. Yeah, the investor that panics turned their dollar into 19 cents. Uh, risk return of the efficient frontier and certainly the best performer since 1999. It took a while to actually get back there, but there's a reason for it. And that's due, due to the, uh, the volatility there. I would love to know how many people held and, as the term is, chilled, as they say, while these things happen and stuck with something like QQQ over that whole time frame. Well, the evidence from studies like the Dalbar studies from the US, uh, like the Morningstar studies, they tend to suggest that not very many investors actually displayed the discipline to stay invested. But as you rightly point out, those that did, yep, they had a bumpier ride. That's why the standard deviation numbers are bigger and to the right of the chart. But those that did hang in there, that stayed the course, they got the best returns, risk and reward. And sources and descriptions of data. Thanks for your time. And bye for now.